welcome everyone to the session from neelu tripathi she is here with us to talk about uh, championing security for your agile development so without further delay go to you neelu thanks manju uh, okay, i'll start sharing my screen yes. hi welcome everyone today we'll be talking about uh, championing security for your agile development um a little bit about me i'm heading security for thoughtworks india and uh, my area of interest is uh, continuous security uh, assessments threat modeling um, and everything in between i uh, have spoken myself at a few conferences uh, earlier and uh, yeah let's uh, dive into the topic so today with respect to um, championing security for agile development um, i wanted to touch upon a few things first uh with respect to that what does the attack surface look like for uh, agile development teams today uh, what do we mean when we say security in layers uh, leveraging how do we leverage the agile rituals in fact the tools and rituals in agile to make sure that security itself is also agile in our context how do we build security in and uh, get agile development teams to that level of security maturity uh and finally with respect to uh, security programs that you have in your organizations how do we design that keeping agile in mind so that we can make it effective and we'll also be discussing uh, the program outcomes for uh, one of the programs that i designed and i do at scale uh, for our agile development teams in thoughtworks so uh in the past uh, few years in fact in the past many years we have been seeing a lot of attacks um data breaches you know ransomware attacks and what not that that keep happening from time to time uh but in the past couple of years particularly you will see there are specific categories of attacks that have gained a lot of prominence and uh, one of uh, those is mostly uh, and uh, which we are you know talking a lot about today is the supply chain attacks and out of the a lot of other attack categories i believe that from a agile development standpoint or in fact from a development standpoint in general uh, it's important to understand why these things are happening uh, and and what are the causes for some of these when when they are happening in the real world so for example uh, and it it is not a specific thing that is leading to supply chain attacks you know because it's it's a very complex uh, sort of an issue which gets exploited and successfully so in many cases in many organizations sometimes the reason could be for example insecure uh, pipeline components which are in use which could then be exploited so for example in case of codecurve uh, it was leaked credentials in their docker image which then you know led to attackers uh, modifying the bash uploader script and and going ahead from there and it did impact you know hundreds of their customers um and this was one component in the entire you know development setup as you can imagine similarly uh, in case of kaseya it was an insecure product and uh, there was an authentication bypass which was the first sort of the exploit point for the attackers which then eventually uh, led to other issues and eventually led to the code execution uh, this again had a direct impact on their 50 customers and then you know hundreds of customers down the line uh, and in case of uber it was AWS credentials that got checked into GitHub and were soon exposed uh, uh, to the attackers and were abused by them to gain access to close to 57 million customer and driver records and then there was a lot of direct financial loss also millions of dollars lost there a lot of impact to uh, to Uber as an organization and this was unmanaged secrets so while we are talking about a few of these there could be many uh, many reasons for these but mostly you will see how closely they are related to a lot of things which are under the control of a development team that way so the attack surface itself uh, reflects what's happening in our development environments many times um but when you look at it uh, there is so much changing in an agile development environment that it becomes very difficult to pinpoint on one thing as such now there are other challenges when it comes to agile uh, when you look at it the the whole landscape itself has changed right which has completely become a microservices landscape a lot of development happens that way um, it's it's lot more distributed now the attack surface if you look at it from uh, an attack perspective it's quite distributed it's scattered and that increases the possibility of getting something that might be vulnerable or you know loosely configured so to say 
Uh, there are also other things with agile development. There are faster releases happening. A lot is changing. The environment is quite dynamic for all of us. There is new technology coming in, a lot of new tech stacks that keep getting introduced from time to time. Uh, even the adoption of agile is not complete for some of us. You know, some of us are still in the journey of becoming agile. So that is also, we were not purely there, you know, completely there. Uh, then for many of us, many of our businesses, the need for compliance is also there. There is regulatory requirement for securing data, for securing assets in, in, in various uh, geographies. And then when you think of all of this amalgamated, uh, to scale it across different teams in your enterprise itself can be a challenge as well. So when you look at your development setup today, I just wanted to show a sneak peek of what it looks like. Uh, and what do we talk about when we will look at it in, in, in different layers? When you look at a development setup, typically you will see that you have a developer, you know, pushing in code to your VCS. Uh, it gets built with your CI. <coughs> the, and, and then you churn out the, the artifact or the container artifact, push it to production, you know, and, and deploy. There are also a lot of other things within, within the supply chain that you are interacting with or consuming from. For example, there are public repos from where you're taking your libraries or dependencies. There are images being pulled in from different registries. You know, so a lot of things are being ingested to form the software that you finally have <coughs> or that application that you have, you have hosted. But apart from these components or, or code, these are all essentially codes in different formats. So all of this automation that we use for, for development, we also have a lot of people surrounding this automation setup. So with respect to coming back to the supply chain attacks that we were talking about, while you will see that I have highlighted a few components here just for you to understand that all of these can be different points of compromise as a component, in each, as a development component. All of these could be compromised depending on the vulnerability which are there, vulnerabilities which are there in these systems. But there are also uh, the entire set of people surrounding it who could be compromised or could be tricked into doing a lot of, or accepting or installing things which they should not. So whenever you talk about security of agile development or it, it tends to, the discussion tends to be about DevSecOps and we tend to focus a lot on having security tooling on the pipeline. Many times that tooling may not be enough. Now, the security tooling on the pipeline helps you identify and detect vulnerabilities in the code that you're writing. And essentially in different ways, right? With SCA, with SAST and all of these other tooling, which are there in the pipeline. But that may not be sufficient for a lot of these other attack scenarios that you keep hearing about today or which are so successful today. For example, logic issues in your product, which can be exploited session issues, supply chain attacks that we keep hearing about, social engineering, phishing, um, endpoint issues, hardware, software issues are there. There are zero days which cannot be accounted for as well. So all of these, for all of these, we'll need to look beyond the security tooling which might be there in our pipeline. So how do we look at it? Uh, as a development team, in fact, even as a security team, the idea is that you look at it in terms of layers. And I've tried to loosely break it down into different uh, layers here. So you would have the people there, uh, network, your network or cloud. <coughs> Excuse me, the environments which are there, the infra components which are there, your supply chain, software, and your custom code as well. Generally, the layer on top impacts or is, and when it, it is compromised, can impact the rest, one or more of the layers below. Uh, that is also one of the reasons why the people layer becomes one of the most important and most crucial when you're trying to have security in place for agile development. So with keeping people in mind, what it is that uh, we should do, uh, this is particularly for security teams that I wanted to call out. When you start setting up security for your agile development teams, it's important to understand, first of all, their development goals. You know, what are they trying to develop? What is the business about? What is the time to market you're looking at? You know, what are the OKRs or business objectives that are defined? What are the performance markers that the team is trying to get to? Apart from the business side, also understand what are their technical challenges and constraints. <coughs> Excuse me. 
those would be a lot of things particularly some crucial ones from a security standpoint will be to look at for example how do they manage dependencies you know um, do they have secure pipelines what is the kind of tooling that's available currently what automation is missing for the teams um, where there is a pr process where there are great are there any gating constraints for them already in place things like that and I think one of the most crucial things to understand, particularly for security teams, is that agile development as a process is very informal. So whatever solution that you come up with or you introduce for the teams should be highly optimized and it should also be very lean. Think of it from the perspective of what they can do on a daily basis. You know, when they take things up, they take up controls or establishing controls in their development environment. <clears throat> the other thing to look at is now this is something that all of us can look at uh, whether your security or your dev teams is to leverage the agile rituals so one of the most prominent and best ways of making security agile in an agile development environment is to leverage what whatever it is that you follow in terms of agile rituals so for example if you are looking at sprint or iteration planning meeting right this is a ritual that generally happens at the beginning of your iteration uh, think of what it is that you can tie up with this particular event, which invariably will get done in the course of the iteration. So, for example, this is an example from the, the SecChamp program that uh, we were driving. We had taken the teams through the entire process of uh, performing the agile set modeling, you know, coming up with the right kind of threads from it, and so on and so forth. But then we had the question of, okay, when do we do it? You know, so it's good that we know how to do it, but when do we do it in the entire iteration? So this was a time when we uh, figured out that in the iteration planning meeting will be the place where we'll actually schedule the threat modeling. We'll pick up a bunch of features and schedule the threat modeling uh, for the team to do. Uh, similarly, you have other things like standups. You could use it for prioritizing security tasks uh, or thinking about or talking about the acceptance criteria with respect to security. <coughs> In sprint reviews, if you're doing manual reviews, for example, manual code reviews, you could also combine them with security code reviews where you could look at logic issues and other things which your tools will not catch uh, or vulnerability scanning results and things like that. In retros, you could think about uh, looking at pen test findings if you have any uh, and also any recurring threats because, for example, entire iteration, you would have done threat modelings. Now, if there are any recurring threats that are happening uh, this might be a time to look at it. Uh, when you're doing your showcase uh, and you are, for example, demonstrating the stories that you have already developed, it would, might might be a good time to look at edge cases from a security standpoint uh, or, you know, security integration issues with other components at that time. And um, in fact, we have seen this work wonderfully, especially when you bring that mindset also for the business teams. So, for example, when you're doing showcases, uh, you would have your business teams also or your clients also alongside. It should not be just the security uh, expert or the sec camp asking these questions. The group should be collectively thinking of, you know, what if scenarios where something could go wrong from a security standpoint. Uh, if you are into backlog grooming, also look at prioritizing some of the high critical security bugs which are there, which may not have been picked up until then. Uh, or any foundational security tasks which you may not have picked up by that time. Apart from agile rituals, uh, it's also good to leverage some of the agile tools. And I think one of the best tools in terms of agile development is uh, <clears throat> the project dashboard. So it looks roughly like this. I just roughly put it together. Like you will have a back backlog and then you will have in progress items. You know who's working on what and uh, you will have your bunch of stories or tasks or bugs or, you know, uh, features called out uh, in this dashboard. Now, I typically you will have all of this from, from a functional standpoint. Uh, you need to think of whether as a development team, are you looking at security as a part of the project dashboard or not? So, for example, if you are, so it would look something like this, where you have the stories that you have already developed would have taken care of your acceptance criteria from a security standpoint. You'll have your security validations all not just coded for, but also tested, you know, by the time it moves to done. Similarly, uh, 
it would also be a place where you have prioritized any critical or high risk security bugs that you have identified any threats uh, that have been identified uh, and all the stories features would take care of you know security validations if that needs to be a part of it now typically in a real scenario you will not have uh, each and every story uh, having this uh, this set of validations required in their context but there will still be many where this is required and it should be complete only when all of that has been taken care of <clears throat> so now we'll talk about building security in so what are the things as a development team that we can do uh, when we are trying to build security into the product you know rather than have a pen test team come towards the end and you know do um, do some testing and go away and then you know next time they come in in, in the next quarter or maybe the next year uh, this is also what what i have realized is one of the fastest ways of doing security in agile is when you start thinking of it much earlier from the very beginning itself because there is no designated separate timeline or period for security to happen <clears throat> so from that perspective if you look at your development setup like we discussed we always talk about vulnerability detection as one of the items is uh, one of the fundamental you know <clears throat> parts for you to look at so you would have maybe your sas or tooling that tooling sca container scanning and so on uh, in place to be able to detect vulnerabilities in the product itself but there are some other practices which generally we consider as functional that will help immensely with security you know so for example uh, starting with a secure source is very important like having secure baseline images from where you can pick from when you're doing development <clears throat> or for example you have a repo for your private repo for your dependencies which you can pick from uh, in some cases although you need to be careful because uh, when you pick from there it could be that so for example many times we have seen that we have uh, we are doing dependency checking and then there are dependencies which are not upgraded yet so if you have such private repos that you are using it's important to keep it updated over a period of time uh, then you would also uh, ensure that you have you know software asset inventory or you know a bill of materials that gives a very clear visibility of what you have in terms of libraries and dependencies for your product uh, and i'll give an example of the recent uh, or not so recent log for j um, <coughs> issue that happened for many of us and specifically in this case uh, you would have realized that most the organizations which or teams, product teams, where they had this kind of a setup, it was much easier for them to figure out what is affected, uh, what is not vulnerable, and what needs to be addressed. Uh, having things like secrets manager uh, is also very important in developing that practice of not even checking in secrets, for example. And this tends to be very preventative than detective, which is a more mature state of being. Uh, artifact signing to help with uh, integrity, Infrastructure as code, if you have, it makes it much easier to have a secure configuration, for example, and also make it repeatable uh, in the long run. And also engineering metrics, like, for example, your mean time to recover or, you know, time to push a uh, critical patch to production. These things can be very important, particularly to limit the, bl the, the blast radius once, for example, there is a critical issue that's been found. So the lesser uh, the time you need to, to push a patch to production, the lesser exposure you will have from that vulnerability. Now these are none of these are exhaustive. So just a disclaimer there. Um, security, when you look at it as a part of development process, uh, there are again a lot of other things which will help other than just having security tooling is, for example, tying it up to a change management system where you can you know identify, for example, just few examples here, like security incidents or your card, which are related to security incidents, which are being addressed uh, and integrated to your uh, project dashboards. With respect to code, one of the most fundamental things which I would like to call out, which a development team should pick up and can easily do is defining acceptance criteria in stories uh, from a security standpoint or addressing all the security requirements for that story or, or set of stories or features. Um, in terms of hardening, 
generally we tend to think of just you know in terms of network isolation um, you know across our environments and things but the idea is to look at do you have clean set of images to start off with um, when we are provisioning infra or if we are the ones managing and handling infra then do are we looking at uh, the right set of benchmarks or cis benchmarks to secure what we are provisioning Vulnerability management itself is a big area, like I mentioned, uh, and this is actually uh, way easier to do with the help of security tooling that's available today. There's a lot of variety for various tech stacks that's there, which can be picked up. But as a development team, uh, what adds that extra edge is to be able to define clear set of DevSecOps KPIs for yourself uh, or SLAs for, for example, addressing or fixing any high critical issues that are identified from this security tooling and of course adhering to that over a period of time <laughs> with logging and monitoring uh, generally because that tends to happen towards the end of our development uh, life cycle uh, often a lot of things are ignored some important things which i commonly uh, see are missing are you know making sure that you are capturing the right kind of security events or auditing events which in the case of an incident will prove to be helpful uh, for us but also looking at targeted alerting so is are the alerts going to the right team at the right time with the right set of you know parameters identified now at the product level this can mean different things so generally you will know in a product you will have business objectives that are defined and which are tied to the results that they're looking for <laughs> Many times it would be the business objectives or you know performance objectives which are clearly called out in the beginning itself, uh, which pertain to you know the product releases. <coughs> the idea is here to go one step further and if possible define so depending on what is the need for how much security is required for your product also and the kind of data you're dealing with and um kind of product you have it might be a good idea to also define your objectives with respect to security at the product level if not at least have the kpis defined for security in terms of what you want to meet in your in your release timelines uh, one good way of map to also structure and look at security that way because there are certain things which are better started at a certain time for example uh, when you're talking about security automation to be in place or uh, securing your pipelines with adding the right kind of tooling it's best to do this in the initial few iterations itself uh, and then later on you can have continuous scanning going on in the entire or the rest of the life cycle uh, in terms of awareness that is something that should come much early on but depending on, for example, when new technology gets added, it's important to also keep repeating it from time to time for the teams. Threat modeling can come in when your development, you know, almost sort of starts and can stay till the end, you know, when you keep looking at threats iteratively from, from time to time. And then also account for more milestone specific uh, security events. For example, you may have pen testing being performed prior to release. You may have audits. Uh, you know, which will happen for your product and all of that need to be accounted for. Uh, not just for the event itself, but also for the preparation, because practically these things require some level of preparation as well, some level of self-review. And then afterwards, when there are issues or findings from there, also time is required for fixing them, you know, or addressing them. So talking about championing security and we looked at, you know, how do you look at the development process? How do you look at the product level? How do you look at it more from um, more from a micro set of metrics that we were talking about? Uh, with respect to people, it means making security a part of the mindset so that everybody is doing it in their own respective roles as a day to day activity rather than as, as a one time activity. Um, that will mean that, of course, uh, awareness is a part of it, uh, but making sure that you're looking at role specific trainings rather than generic security trainings to make it effective. So, for example, in the SecCham program that we were driving, one of the uh, main goals we had with awareness was to make it as hands on as possible and to enable teams to do it on their own. 
the second thing is to have the right resources shared with all the development teams the development teams can also reach out and ask for some of these generally security teams would come up with these resources all of these as as handy as possible uh, is the idea so that the dev teams can take it and then run with these um, it should also be actionable and timely because time is of uh, of essence in in agile development <clears throat> so having frequent touch points with security is a good idea and vice versa with the development teams is also a good idea keep it evolving so all the so whether it is awareness and the idea of for example um, latest patches coming in for any vulnerabilities uh, issues with new technologies that you're going to adopt and all of that it needs to evolve over a period of time and keep getting updated because a lot is changing uh, on the security side as well and lastly it's important to um, create a community of everyone uh, in this space so, for example, for the SecCham program uh, that we were driving, we created the community of SecCham where all SecChams could come together, talk to each other about security challenges that they may have when they're actually doing, for example, enabling some automation or performing threat modelings and all of that, and <clears throat> be able to discuss that with each other. And you know, that helps solve a lot of problems and helps it scale and be sustainable over a long period of time. Because there's only so much that a small security team can do uh, at the end of the day in a, in a large enterprise. So this is a very good and efficient way of actually scaling your security initiatives across the agile development teams. So to put it simply and a little more visually, uh, when you start off with your, you know, the, the development life cycle, essentially uh, have education as early as possible have the right kind of awareness for uh, different roles in the team it could also depend on the tech stack that you are going to pick up right so it could also be language specific so when you're talking about uh, code security training it could be based on specifically the code that you are or the language that you're going to pick up in the design phase focus on identifying threats early on in the life cycle <coughs> excuse me when you are uh, creating your backlog uh, for the stories, it's important to also add everything from a security standpoint there. Uh, and this should include, for example, the threats that you might have identified. Generally, what we do or what we did for the program was once we identified threats, we would convert it to the right kind of story or, uh, for example, security task or bug or, you know, a different category because not every issue needs to be a story or a feature and then add that to the project dashboard. This needs to be prioritized and then addressed by, for example, uh, by allocating a dev pair who could then fix or address these issues. Uh, during development, leverage as much as possible all the security automation, security to tooling that you may have. So that could be your SAS, your, your SCA DAST, container scanning, you know, and even infra security review and all of that um, in, a, in a most automated fashion. But the idea is that towards the end of all of this, you are as a team come together and you know retrospect on or reflect on what are the issues, analyze, see what are the recurring, for example, threads, recurring findings from these scanning tools and all of that, which can be avoided in the next iteration. Uh, this could be so this feedback that comes in from this tooling or from the threat modeling and other things that you perform can can be added as a part of security unit tests in some cases. Not in all cases. Uh, in some cases, you could add it as uh, an acceptance criteria in these kind of stories, right? So that right kind of validations take care of these issues in the from the get go. So <clears throat> finally, uh, with respect to the security program that you may have in your organization, how do you keep agile in mind um, when creating that? So many times, so we have different kind of programs in different organizations. So it, in your context, it might be different, but essentially it's important to look at different kind of teams. Uh, for example, if different teams are using different tech stacks or have different compliance requirements <clears throat> that's possible for different products, then pick up a variety of that, see how your program suits uh, or is effective for each of those. So have the right kind of teams and, and when you are designing your pilot, particularly in your program. When you're thinking of the awareness aspect, uh, make sure that you are you are thinking of awareness, which is more effective to create that critical thinking with respect to your program goals. 
and it is very practical for the the agile development teams to pick up and run with it when you are at the execution phase for your program you should look at of course implementation of controls but how can you do that collaboratively with the developers or dev teams so dev and security need to work collaboratively when we are specifically talking about security programs being run for you know dev teams and it's also very important to keep it lean so that it can be picked up by the teams themselves when you're doing the governance and you're looking at the metrics keep the metrics simplified with the, with respect to your program metrics should be such that can be measured by the development teams themselves and also by the security teams but <clears throat> the idea is also to keep it transparent in a way across teams so that drives a sense of competition uh, is healthy in a way uh, that you can see and measure it on your own as a development team and then of course improve it over a period of time it's important to keep getting feedbacks because the agile development context itself keeps changing a lot from time to time so for security teams particularly it's very important to keep getting feedbacks from time to time lastly when you are thinking of scaling your security program across the the development org it's important to simplify it as much as possible to make it very handy to have the right processes in place which can be you know right processes and the right tooling in place uh, which can be picked up and and the teams can own it on their own uh, but also make it a part of the culture you know make it a part of the practice so that it can scale easily effectively across all the teams in your development org when you're looking at the maturity uh, of uh, your own team for example your own uh, the agile development team or as a security team if you're looking at the maturity it's one part of it is to look at <coughs> the specific metrics that we've been talking about so it typically it would be number of vulnerabilities which are being detected through the tooling that you're adding or you know number of critical high risk issues that are being fixed and how frequently uh, by these teams a rate of implementation and all, all of that uh, but one of the good things to focus on uh, with respect to the program or with respect to your security program will be that uh, if this metric that you are trying to measure is driving a behavior change or not so i'll give an example so when uh, one of the main things that that was at the heart of our uh, the secchamp program was threat identification uh, but we tried to when we were setting the metric we did not keep the metric as the number of threats found rather the metric for us was the frequency of threat modeling so how frequently are the teams actually getting into the <coughs> activity of doing threat modeling and that is what is what we wanted to grow so the practice of looking at threats or analyzing threats was you know the one that will drive the behavior change eventually there could also be uh, some non measurable uh, parameters for example how proactive are the teams with uh, with doing security right so uh, for example in our case it was while they are doing they're looking at threat modeling in the design phase uh some of them would proactively go out and ask the businesses or the client around what are the specific security requirements uh around a set of features or in general for the product so overall all of this together will give you a unified picture of the actual security posture of uh, uh, where you stand in terms of security maturity so uh to quickly discuss some of the program outcomes um, of the secchamp program that uh, that we were driving this was for close to uh, 200 secchamps at that time um there are certain things that we focused on in every phase uh, in the kick off or onboarding we focused on nominating the secchamps which was to be you know secchamps who are actually passionate about security so that it became more sustainable for us with awareness we focused on keeping it hands on um, and keeping the threat modeling as way more agile so we reduced the timelines to you know close to 1 hour 1 uh, hour 1 and 1/2 hours for project level threat modeling and for feature specific threat modeling to 45 minutes um in execution we <coughs> mostly were focusing on having more concrete actionable tasks for the dev teams to look at or in this case for the sec champs to look at um in case of governance we made sure that we are collaborating more with developers we are meeting them more often 
uh, and what we are measuring points to a behavior change, like I mentioned uh, just now. And when we were scaling, the idea was to build a community where they can interact with each other, share those uh, their own security challenges, help each other solve it, and also own their journey as a security champion. So this led to us proactively uncovering hundreds of threats uh, very soon, addressing in, uh, addressing most of these high critical issues that were identified as a part of threat identification. Um, the SecChamps became the security point of contact. So they were no more just doing threat identification because once, once they matured to a certain degree, they started looking at a lot of other things like security automation, what needs to be put on the pipeline and, and a lot of other things. And eventually uh, the push model changed to the pull model for us where uh, earlier we were reaching out to teams for enrolling in the SecChamp program. But uh, soon once this got established, we started all the new teams that that were forming were actually started reaching out to us to become or to enroll into the program itself, which made the job much easier. So as a small security team, it's much easier if you know people are reaching out to you uh, for all of this than you reaching out to all different uh, team, depending on how many teams you're dealing with. So yeah, that's the benefit that we saw of uh, of driving it in this manner. So lastly, with respect to Agile in mind, how do we champion security? Uh, focus on individuals and interaction over you know, following set standards. Uh, traditionally, we have been doing security in a very slow fashion. Uh, in an Agile setup, it's important to focus on uh, the interactions that you have. Focus on a working security model than having elaborate processes uh, or elaborate documentation for things. Uh, it's important to go via the route of collaboration almost always helps and is almost always effective in an agile development setup. And lastly, it's important to respond to change because the agile development environment is quite dynamic, particularly from a security standpoint. So you should be able to adapt uh, and work with the dev teams to come to the right working security solution for your agile development teams. So, yeah, it's pretty much uh, taken from uh, the Agile Manifesto. And I think uh, all of that really works well with Agile security as well. So that's all from me today. Thanks a lot. Uh, no questions on the Q&A right now. I mean, it was a wonderful session. I mean, like, uh, I think I think security in and out has been covered uh, right from uh, the execution to the mindset. Mm -hmm.